millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am, but Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because, let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high-quality, grass-fed, and grass-finished beef, organic chicken, pork-raised crate-free, and wild-caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com etm. And use code ETM to choose your free offer and get $20 off. And I think the appeal to domes is that they're very unique and they look kind of almost Mars-ish. Like it feels very, that almost like supernatural. They're just really weird little structures. And so I think people like the way they look. So I think they're just becoming kind of a hot topic now. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Have you seen the prices of houses lately? Whether you're in the market to buy a home now or even just renting in many markets, it is so out of reach these days. It's no wonder why there's this movement towards alternative and more affordable houses like RVs and campers and yurts and tree houses. And on this episode, we're going to explore dome homes. Our guest, she's been on the show before. She's amazing, Whitney Hansen. She's a money expert, host of the Money Nerds podcast, and a dome living expert who believes that dome living has so much to offer. And with something like a dome, I think people like these a lot because it is portable. You can just completely up and move your entire structure with, you know, a weekend or two. Whitney's Dome, the Cascade Dome in Idaho, it is a beautiful example of a new way of living and even making money. So in this episode, we're going to explore the ins and outs of building a dome home, how much Whitney actually spent building her dome home. She gets super transparent, ways to save money while still building a quality dome home, and how to turn your new dome home into a wealth generating and cash flowing business. We'll even talk about an Airbnb contest she won to build a flower pot house. All right, have I piqued your interest? Let's start talking. You know, I I think if it wasn't for the pandemic, we probably wouldn't be here having this conversation. But since that did happen, you know, we have seen this just rise just I mean, a cascade of of alternative housing, whether it's yurts or RVs or campers. And what we're here to talk about today is dome living, which um, you know I'm seeing kind of pop up all over the place. And I watched your journey of, of building your Cascade Dome in Idaho, where you live. And you know I want to dive into your, your story and 
all of the you know nuts and bolts around it, but just to kind of get us started, what is the you know what is the attraction to domes? Is this a new trend, or do you think they're here to stay? I think they are just getting started. I think the the cool thing about domes themselves is the structure itself is very strong. And so it goes back to, I want to say like the 50s or 60s when an engineer designed this structure to be the strongest structure they could possibly make. And so it came into, it's great for snow load. It's really good for wind, like all of these different things. It's a really cool structure. And I think the appeal to domes is that they're very unique and they look kind of almost Mars-ish. Like it feels very, that almost like supernatural. They're just really weird little structures. And so I think people like the way they look. So I think they're just becoming kind of a hot topic now. Oh, I like it. Yeah. I mean, I never thought that they looked a little, you know, UFO-ish. But, you know, now that I'm <laughs> totally. thinking about it, I'm like, yeah, okay, it does look like this kind of cool, like, you know, space vehicle sitting out in, in you know, usually in beautiful locations. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're fascinating, right? I think that's the thing about alternative housing is it's really interesting. Like if you don't live that way or you haven't experienced alternative housing, there's a intrigue to it, right? Like there's a, well, I just kind of have to check it out. Yeah. I so agree with you on that. I think there's, there's a lot of draw to that. And I think historically we've always been drawn to just unique and interesting types of housing. It's just, it's eye catching. So immediately we want to learn more. We want to kind of peek in there and see what's going on. And I think the other cool thing about alternative housing is depending on how you structure it and how you build it, it can be very economical from an overall cost perspective. So I think there's a big draw for that too. Yeah. I want to talk about that for a minute. We know that traditional housing prices, they have risen about you know 20% of the last couple of years. I think the the recent average price is around $453,000, which has just become so unaffordable for mm-hmm. so many people and this idea of you know whether it's whether it's a smart idea to buy a house or not is kind of you know out of out of the question because we all have this dream of of buying a house, right? It's it's the American dream and there's something about owning a piece of property that feels like you've done it. You you know, you've mm-hmm. done something something great. So, you know, tell me a little bit about the the number side of of dome. What makes it so attractive and and so kind of eco-friendly as as a housing alternative? Well, the cool thing about domes specifically is it's a temporary structure. And so that's the good and the bad, I guess, oh, in one. Okay. <laughs> and so with domes, you can build them as permanent structures, but the style of dome that I have is more similar to a yurt. And so if you think of a yurt, it's it's almost this like canvas material on the outside. It has a frame, but it is portable. And so the geodome that I have is a portable dome. So you have like metal struts that all meet in a specific hub. And then from there, you have a PVC canvas that goes over the top and then a massive vinyl window, so to speak. And so that structure is really interesting for people because I think so many people love the idea of owning property or owning some type of a structure, but they don't like the permanency of that. So sometimes it's a little bit scary. What if I don't want to live in Idaho forever? What if I want to move to Colorado? And with something like a dome, I think people like these a lot because it is portable. You can just completely up and move your entire structure with, you know, a weekend or two. Really? Okay. I, that that's kind of like a new uh new idea to me. I didn't I didn't know that was the case. So yeah. you do you actually then have to buy the, the you know the plot of land that the dome actually sits on? Or how does that work? Yeah, I've seen a few different ways. So the way that we set up the dome is we purchased a piece of property for $35,000. And this is before the pandemic hype. So great deal. Could not find that today. But when we purchased that, we were initially thinking we were going to do more of like a small cabin, like a just cute modern Scandinavian style cabin. And what we found is the lot was not really conducive for a traditional home. It was just very expensive. It didn't quite fit. And so what we learned is that lot was more of a camp style lot, was a better suited property for that. And so that's where we came across the dome. We purchased our dome from a company called Pacific Domes. The uh, struts had to be upgraded for our snow load. So I think all in the dome cost with an insulation liner, the struts and the canvas was $15,000 for just the dome piece alone. 
Oh, wow. Okay. So that's, that's pretty affordable. If we, if we add yeah. in the, you know, the price of the land, tell me a little bit about, um, how do you go about finding a piece of property that, um, you know, would be a desirable location, uh, mm-hmm. but also would be one that is, that is affordable. Yeah, I think the the biggest piece is knowing the intention behind the property. So for us, this was an investment property where we could rent it on Airbnb and hopefully make some some money eventually and get some of our cash back. But if you're doing this as a permanent structure, like you, you intend on living there full time, I would start with the county that you think you might want to purchase in. So if you're doing it as an investment, anything close to a national forest, national parks, a populated area you're probably going to do okay with your bookings. If you go outside of that, it's going to be kind of hard to attract people to come to your investment property and spend money to stay there. But if you're doing it for your full-time residence, you have to check with the county to make sure that they will actually allow that type of structure to be built in their county. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. It is a unique structure, so not all counties are on board with the alternative housing there. Hmm. That's interesting. That's the, I, I just find it it's so fascinating that specifically because you started out not thinking that that was what you were going to build, uh, mm-hmm. which I think makes the journey even more um, exciting, scary. I don't know, kind of, <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, definitely an experience along the way. Yes. And you talked about Airbnb. Um, I, I want to spend some time talking about this because. You know, we hear about Airbnb everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there are a lot of stories now that during the pandemic, um, you know, all, every city had just this explosion of Airbnb properties. And, you know, people were making great money. And then all of a sudden, you know, kind of last year into this year hit and uh, housing prices are changing. And also the way people are traveling and um, exploring is different too. People are going back to staying in hotels and, you know, wanting that experience. And so there are a lot of Airbnbs that are just staying empty and people, are, you know, are, are not able to recoup uh, their costs or, or make any money. So tell me a little bit about like, how you chose the Airbnb model and how does that actually really work and turn into dollars for you? It's such a good question because I think we're over the next year going to see a lot more about the, they're calling it the Airbnb bust. <laughs> So I think you're going to see a lot more of that. And I think what's what's really interesting is when you look at alternative housing and properties that are almost recession proof, so to speak, it tends to be properties that are more of an experience. Those ones, while sure, will be impacted by recessions. It's not to the same degree as a really cool condo in a normal city. Those types of properties are more experiences. And so people will really seek those out. And so how I knew that that was a, a thing is one of my best friends, this is her full-time job is building really unique kind of weird structures. It's a good and so to when, have. She's amazing. <laughs> like poor girl is like constantly getting like, what about this? What about this? <laughs> so she's always getting bugged by me. But what I learned from her experience is that throughout all of this time, all of her properties stay fairly booked. And this is not just like a one year thing. Like she's been doing this for almost 10 years. And historically, a lot of the properties kind of go up and down depending on what the economy is doing. But these unique destination style experiences stay pretty consistent from a profitability standpoint and a booking standpoint. And so I think that's going to stay true pretty much forever. Like maybe the platform where we book will be different, but I think people Mm -hmm. are always seeking unique experiences. And I know that it's not just about getting a, a piece of property and getting the dome structure. Like you've actually created an experience and, and that's what is attracting people and what will attract people in, in the future. And I think it's really important if we're, if we're listening and we love this idea of alternative housing, maybe even domes, that, that we really hear your story of, of how you really created an experience. Because I watched your story on, on Instagram and um i you know i know you i know you personally and you know just watching everything watching you like dig you know dig up the ground to lay <laughs> stairs and just i mean all of these things that i wouldn't think about but all are part of the experience and really important so if you I, you know we're we're here audio we're listening but walk us around your dome a little bit and tell us 
you know, what do we see? What are we experiencing? What's inside the dome, outside the dome, kind of all of that good stuff. Yeah. So this is funny that you you say paint that picture, what it looks like, because when I was creating this property in my head, and for anybody that's starting to create one, I think this is where you start with your guest experience is close your eyes and imagine you're the guest. You just show up at this property. What do you see? How do you get down to the dome? How do you get to the different places? And so for me, that was really helpful. So when somebody pulls up, they immediately pull up to a driveway and it's a very small driveway, one parking spot. They walk down a bunch of stairs. I think we're talking like 30 or 50 stairs. Like it's a t- it's a sloped lot. So they walk down a lot of stairs and then they get through a fire pit area that's nestled into these massive granite boulders, like bigger than cars. They're incredible. And that's where a little fire pit area is. So then they continue down and then they get to the dome. So when you first enter the dome, it's really incredible because it's so large. Like the ceilings are 12 or 13 feet. And I don't think you quite understand how tall that is until you get in there. And it's just this sense of awe. And then with the massive panoramic window, all you see is just trees and the forest. And it immediately just makes you kind of calm down, which is so fun. And so in the center of the dome, we have a keen sized bed. We have a wood stove for heat We have a little kitchen table where you can sit there and play games and, of course, a coffee bar. So that's inside of the dome. And then the outside of the dome, we built a sauna. So it's like a 70 square foot little building. Actually, I think it's only 49. It's not very big at all. But it's a very small building and it's just enough space for two people to change and then a wood stove for heating up all of the stuff and kind of enjoying a little sauna sesh in the middle of the forest. So that's kind of the the property in a nutshell. Wow. I mean, it just, it sounds um, magical. Um, I am like the first person that um, will say I'm I'm not a good um, camper person. <laughs> <laughs> totally, I, yeah. I definitely um, enjoy modern conveniences and I'm not, I'm not ashamed <laughs> to say that, but there's something about a dome and watching your your dome get, uh, you know, built in the experience, um, you know, everything from the fire pit and the little sauna area and everything like that. That is, it's, it's something that I think as a traveler, again, I go back to this idea of kind of like a mystique, like it's almost like you, you Mm -hmm. you know, you really want to experience something like that. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious if, uh, you know, there are companies kind of around the country that you can go to, um, for like the dome supplies, or are there only a few places that really, um, you know, have all the equipment you need to to create a dome like yours? There's a couple that are probably most common, and that would be Pacific Domes, the company I went through. I would say they are the most expensive, but have amazing customer service. They are very responsive. So that part was super important to me. They also give you good instructions, which I've learned people that buy from like Alibaba are very disappointed because they're like, where does this even go? Like, I don't understand it. <laughs> so it like, I, like Ikea instructions yeah. with just pictures that don't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, totally. I think so. I've seen some pretty, pretty sad stories there. Um, another company that's very popular is called F Domes. And it's just fdomes.com. And I hear that that one's pretty great too. I don't have any experience with them. But there's lots of options from that standpoint. I just wouldn't cheap out if you want to do a dome. Like I, I wouldn't go the cheap route. I think the canvas will break and tear easier. It'll break down a little bit faster under the sun. And it's going to be a pain in the butt to set up. And I can tell you from experience that even with good instructions, they are not enjoyable to set up. So definitely don't skimp out on the price point. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. 
but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire, Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. And did you have a a crew that helped you put this dome together, or was this um, just kind of your own blood, sweat, and tears uh, putting this thing together. I had a crew of my family, (laughs) so I (laughs) I owed them a lot of coffee. Um, You need about four people to set up the dome frame, and then the cover itself is very heavy. So you probably need at least a few, probably four or five people actually, to kind of hoist it over the top of that and then get it positioned. And it's a very tedious process. And then the cover itself will last between seven and 10 years, depending on how your temperature, your climate is, how well you take care of it. But your frame itself will always last, but you will have to replace that outside cover at some point. So that's like the exterior. And then the interior piece is an insulation liner, which if you're in a snowy climate or extreme temperatures of any type, you definitely want this because domes, even with that liner, are incredibly cold in the winter and incredibly hot in the summer. And so just keep that in mind. It's more of a tent. And so if you can think about that, it it helps when you prepare your your site. And for a guest staying there, I would imagine they have to be prepared for that too, right? Because there's there's obviously not air conditioning and there's no other heating than than the stove unit you have in there. Yes, exactly. And there can be. I've seen some really incredible domes actually in North Carolina. So hopefully you can go visit them. But there's some really amazing ones that have a full-fledged bathroom. They have an entire kitchen. They have like running water. So it's not all primitive camping like mine is. Some of them (laughs) are actually really like a house. They're really cool. Okay, that's the type of dome. uh... (laughs) Go to that one. You'll love it. (laughs) That's the type of dome I could could find myself in. All right, I want to get to a little bit. You you talked a little bit, but I want to get a little into into the nitty gritty. If we're listening and we want to build one of these, like how do we know things like you know what size the the materials um, mm. that we need? How do we tr- try to suss all that out? 
I would say if you're going to try to live in this maybe full time. So let's assume that you actually want to this is the lifestyle you want to live full time in. At least a 24 foot diameter dome would be enough to give you a small kitchen, a bathroom and like a true bedroom. And so that is the size I would do if I was living it in it full time. If you're just doing what I'm doing, you're just trying to make a little extra cash, 20 foot dome is what we have and that's perfect. It gives you enough space to not feel claustrophobic, um but not enough space to be full-time living. And so that's the two sizes I would at least consider. And then as far as like materials, what you really have to do is you have to go to your your county. And I keep going back to this because it's so important. They can shut down the idea immediately. Like we had to go through a hearing process and pitch our dome to this city council and just talk really? about it. And yeah, it's a very extensive process. I don't think people understand. And that's because we're renting it and because it's not a normal traditional house. And so if you run into any issues, you're, you're going to have to go to the county, you're going to have to state your case and pitch the idea. And then people get to, from the community, talk about whether they support or against the idea. And so that is a big portion of it too. So that's the other thing. And then with that county permissions, they're going to tell you what you need for your foundation. So the dome itself is fairly inexpensive. The foundation can be very expensive. So for us, our foundation itself was about $22,000 for just the deck that the dome sits on. And so it literally costs more than the dome itself. And so that's just something to be aware of too. And so obviously it would make sense that you do that process. You go to the county first before you start building and buying and all of that good stuff. Yes. I would say the way that we purchase the lot is not what I would recommend for people. I think if you're doing it for an investment, you want to know what can you do with the land before you purchase. We knew we wanted to buy in that area regardless. So for us, it was an investment no matter what, even if we just sat on the land for years. Uh, But yeah, beforehand, you just want to make sure you talk to the county and say, here's what I'm thinking of doing. I want to build a (laughs) geodome. It's a temporary structure. That key language is, is everything. Temporary structure. It'll sit on a permanent foundation. Is this something I could even do in this county? And ask a lot of questions. If they say no, just ask, what what do I need to do to get that approved? Like, is there anything else I could do? Do you allow yurts? And so you can start to figure out what's their hesitation with agreeing to the structure. And sometimes it works and sometimes they just will not work with you and you need to move on. That's such great advice, though, because I probably wouldn't think about doing that that step. Um, so I think that, that that's so important before you put down any amount of money to to figure all of that out first, because you could yeah. obviously probably change your location or maybe even a, a different state, depending on you know uh, where you're trying to, to build your dome. I'm wondering, since you are a money person, you also host a money podcast, The Money Nerd. So you talk about money all the time, just like I do. Were there any costs that that kind of creeped up you weren't you know expecting? What were the, what were the, some of the, like the biggest money lessons that you learned during this process? Shoot, man, I wasted so much money. Um, <laughs> I really did. <laughs> it's all those like random trips to Home Depot and Lowe's that you have to to go to. I would say one of the biggest lessons is I haven't really publicly talked about this too much, so I won't share like how much we got ripped off. But we hired who we thought was a contractor and since learned that they were not at all and basically paid them a big amount down and got nothing for it. And so that was like mistake number one is not doing our due diligence with a contractor when we were hiring. The other big mistake, I don't even know if it was a mistake. It just was a cost that we weren't anticipating was the lumber hike. And so that's oh, when yes. the project itself was probably about 50% more expensive than it should have been in a normal economy. Um, but that, yeah, we were building in the peak of it. I mean, yeah, I, I, I wasn't even thinking about the lumber hike, but um, all of those things. And those are X factors mm-hmm. that you just can't control when you're, when you're building something. You don't know what's going to happen. So you have to always build in some sort of pad knowing that it's just going to be more expensive yep. than you think. <laughs> Yeah. And if someone wants to do this and they're like, well, how much should I actually set aside for this? Assuming the county's on board, I'm not going to do a full fledged bathroom or kitchen. I'm going to do a more primitive campsite, like what I'm talking about. I would say I would plan for at least 50 to $60,000 
on top of the land cost. And I think if you do that, you'll have a really nice setup. You can have some fun amenities and that will get you into the market. It's just not going to be like a full-fledged house. Talk to me a little bit too about the viability of making money from your dome. So obviously, I know this depends on so many factors, where your dome is, the amenities you have in your dome, so many different factors. But maybe just kind of a rough idea. If we if we spend this money to create uh, a dope for ourselves and we want it for income purposes, what's mm-hmm. the reality? Like, What kind of numbers are we looking at to actually make make money on this? So our revenue projections, notice projections, we don't have a full year of data yet, <laughs> is about $30,000 is what we're anticipating. So here's kind of the weird thing. We charge between $150 and $165 a night. We've been open almost a full two months now to the public. And the first time that I put that price point out there of $165 a night, I thought for sure no one is going to rent a dome with a porta potty, not even a full kitchen. Like, who is going to do this? But people do. And it's interesting because they pay more for that type of an experience versus even an actual cabin. And so I, I find that to be fascinating as an investor. I just think it's it's interesting. And then the secondary piece is to give people context. When we launched our dome, we were about probably midway through December is when we started to really open up our calendar more. We did a two night minimum and we had one day before and after blocked off. So it really limited the amount of days that we could do just because winter is crazy up there. And so we were experimenting with that. The first month we made about $1,450, so $1,450. And so now we are into month two and it's looking like about $2,000. And so this is our slower season. So I, I anticipate three to $4,000 come some summer. But that gives you at least an idea of how you can do this, even with the two night minimum and with having a day before and after blocked off. So it's really interesting. You can actually make pretty decent money. What about things like housekeeping? Do you have to also then pay to have, you know, hire a crew to come in and, and change over from guest to guest? You do. So this was an interesting piece that I heard very early on from one of my friends, and I thought it was really good advice. When you have a unique structure like this, any type of off the grid property, any type of just non traditional home, what you're really looking for is what's called a caretaker, not a cleaner. And so the the way you find that person is a little bit different. So you're not just hiring a cleaning company saying, hey, just come in and do the turnover. You're actually hiring somebody who does a little bit of like, they got to bring in firewood occasionally. They have to make sure your supplies are stocked, like they are your eyes and ears. And so when you're looking for somebody, make sure that you are thinking about that job description of what they actually will be doing. And in this case, it's not a cleaner, it's, it is a caretaker. And so the way that we hire is actually through Craigslist. We find Ooh. that to be best. Yeah, kind of weird. Craigslist, like, come back for the win. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you, it really did. And so we will pay, you know, $25 per category on Craigslist to run an ad. So we usually will promote into different categories. And that's how we have found our people. It's pretty cool. So what do you think the future of domes in really alternative housing, what do you think it's going to look like over the next, I don't know, like three to five years? Do you think we're we're still going to be uh, really interested in alternative housing and also alternative travel this way? I really do. I think from a consumeristic standpoint, People want those alternative houses. I think you're going to see a lot more earth bag homes, straw bale homes. All of these different types of structures are really intriguing because they're more environmentally friendly, which is great. And then they're also a little bit less expensive. So that's the other cool piece too, is I think people are naturally gravitating towards that. We don't want to spend $600,000 for a home and then have to turn around in a few years and maybe sell it. Like It's kind of a pain in the butt. But something like this, you could actually maintain that home and keep that home longer term because you might only be in $150,000. So it can make a lot more financial sense. So I think that's one key piece. And then as far as like domes and alternative structures from a travel perspective, that is just taking off. And I think even if you look at Airbnb, the way they redid their categories, where now they show you all these different cool, unique categories where you can search for national parks, you can search for domes, you can search for silo homes. All of this stuff is really sending a very clear message that 
People want experiences. That's how we're starting to travel is I saw a cool thing on Instagram or Airbnb (laughs) and I pictured myself there and pretty soon I'm in Idaho. Like that's how this stuff works now. It's so crazy. (laughs) Yeah, I I just, I love it. And you have, you've been on the show many, many times and we've talked about all sorts of things from uh, money topics to furniture flipping. You are just kind of the queen of of building these side hustles and trying all these things and reporting back whether they work or don't work. And so you're, you're this, I think the dome was kind of your entree into this, you know, alternative housing, alternative travel world. But I know you also just won this really prestigious um, prize from Airbnb and you are building a flower pot house, I believe. We we have to know more about this. I am building a flower pot house. And so this came about, Airbnb was doing a global competition where they were calling for kind of the wackiest ideas. Now, keep in mind, they're putting $10 million behind people's ideas. This is a huge statement. They want you to pursue wacky structures because this is what people are seeking on their platform. They're seeing that trend. So they're putting a lot of money behind that. And so with that fund, Tony and I just decided, we're like, hey, what if we just apply? And you know, at this time, my mom wanted to do a flower farm on her property in Idaho. And I was like, well, what could we do that would support her retirement, a little bit of cash for me and fit that flower farm? And that's where we came up with this idea of a life-size terracotta flower <laughs> pot, <laughs> as we do. <laughs> totally normal. <laughs> totally normal. I mean, totally. To, how do you how do you transform transform I should say a, a flower pot into a home is it is it just you know we're making it on the outside really appear like a flower pot we're using traditional materials or yes this really bummed me out initially I wanted to do an earth bag technique because I thought that's like so cool it's very fitting it's a flower pot and it's actually made out of earth that would have been amazing but that alternative structure with the shape that tapered shape just would not have worked and so we had to go back to the drawing board so it'll be a traditionally framed house that is tapered and then stuccoed on the outside to look like terracotta and then on the inside we'll have that taper as well with a little rooftop patio so it's going to be really cool <laughs> i mean it just sounds amazing who would not want to stay in a in a flower pot i mean it just <laughs> it sounds amazing so what's what's the timeline like how long is this going to take you to build and and when can we expect this so the timeline per airbnb's fund requirements is it has to be turnkey by August of 2023. And so we're very much in the planning process. I have to go down and get permits pulled tomorrow, actually. And so that's where we're at with this. And because that timeline is so tight, we don't have a lot of time for us to do the build. With the dome, we did it on weekends and it was great. With this project, we don't have the luxury of time. So we have to hire contractors and get some help to just really get it going faster. Uh, The intention is we'll have them frame and exterior. All of that portion will be done by contractors. And then the interior, we can just come in and do some of the fun finish work. So that's kind of what we're thinking. I, I like. I seriously just can't. I just can't wait. I think everybody needs to to follow you just to follow along this journey. I'm curious. Tell me a little bit about where did your love for doing side hustles and kind of all these unique things come from to to build wealth? I have always, as you know this from my furniture flipping, I love DIY. I just love it. I think it's so much fun and I love investing. And so I think that was a natural fit. But where that really came from is when I was a kid, my dad owned a pallet distributing company. And so he would rebuild pallets and sell those. And I used to I mean, shoot, I was like eight or nine and I was out there using a saw and hammering. And and so it's always so part of like my normal DNA, I guess, that it's just always been, I thought everybody could swing a hammer. You know, that's just how I grew up. <laughs> I, I have a... Um... I have a vision for taking a piece of furniture or something and transforming it, but I've I've not actually done it yet. Oh, you but have there, to. There's, 
there's still hope. There's still hope. <laughs> it is so I think the the first time you flip a piece of furniture and you realize that you bought something for like 20 or $30, put in a couple hours and sold it for a few hundred, you will be addicted. It is so much fun. Well, I would love for you to tell everyone listening if they're really interested in this idea of of building a dome. They think, okay, this is something cool to to at least explore. What do you want us to take away from this conversation? I think the first thing to do is to go look on Airbnb, go under the domes category and go book a stay at one to see if you actually really like it or if you just like the idea of it. And I would choose a time where it's either really hot or really cold historically, like normal, you know, that way you get the best and the worst of it. You get to experience it and see, okay, could I actually live in this full time if that's my goal? Could I expect guests to live in this if that's my other goal to make a little extra cash? So that's where I'd start. And I would just do a little layout when you stay there, think through your process. What did you love? What did you not love? And just see if it's something that you actually want to pursue. Okay, I've got one last question. Has absolutely nothing to do with domes, but uh, my producer Jeff just has to know this about Boise State. As wow. um, as fans of Boise State, you also teach at Boise State. He just he really needs to know if you guys love the blue football field, <laughs> or if uh, that's just not something you you know you really like. Jeff, you're gonna be so disappointed. I'm not even a football person. <laughs> Yeah, we do actually. I think the blue turf is a point of pride for Boiseans. It, it is very much a thing that we we get behind and we kind of wear, I guess, proudly. <laughs> if you haven't checked out Whitney's Cascade Dome Home, you absolutely need to do so. Like I said, it is so beautiful. I'm even considering a stay. What I love about conversations like this is that you get to really think outside of the box when it comes to creating cash flow and building wealth. So if you can't afford a single family house, maybe you start investing in something like a dome to build up your house savings fund. Or maybe you add a dome as a vacation home that also earns you some cash. There are just so many possibilities to play with here. You can find Whitney on Instagram at Whitney underscore Hanson underscore co. And you can see everything about her Cascade Dome Home and the very out-of-the-box flower pot house that she's building there. You can also listen to our podcast, Money Nerds, on any podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone else who might be really interested in the idea of building a dome. As always, you can head to the show notes for all the links to our episode guests, as well as the sponsors who make this show possible. I'll see you back here in a few days for a brand new episode. (music) 